a bit circular and put you there. Okay. So I'm going now to talk to you um, as a little introduction to the course about what, how do we see expert disagreement and what do we think philosophical bias are or what do we say they are and why they matter for democracy in science. So there is the ideal of a science as objective and transparent and free from bias, or at least if it is uh, not perfect, it should be the best uh, way we have to make an inquiry which is as objective and transparent and free from bias as it gets. And uh, in the, especially in the last years, especially from since this famous Ioannidis paper in 2005 that most of you I think will remember, why most published research findings are false, which was a, a bit of a bomb uh, for the scientific community and also for the public. There was, uh, the scientific community has made substantial efforts actually to detect, explicate and critically examine different types of bias. Uh, and there's been a lot of uh, uh, improvement in that. And there's even a catalog of bias uh, at that link that I put uh, from the Oxford Center for Evidence-Based Medicine, where you can go and look at different types of bias. There are uh, loads of them uh, with examples of it. But despite of that, still experts give contradictory answers to the same scientific question. And I think that in the last weeks, we had uh, a remarkable example that we are living in the era of scientific and expert disagreement with the COVID-19. We've been reading newspapers and we've seen experts uh, giving a, a, a whole sort of different answers to the questions we had, all basing themselves on data, on fa facts uh, and on science. One thing is that experts from different fields answer differently to the same question. For instance, what is the most sustainable strategy to stop the spreading of the virus? Uh, most sustainable, of course, epidemiologists had different ideas, for instance, from economists. But it also uh, happened from experts from the, same, uh, uh, from the same discipline. So should we have social distances or not? Will it work? How much should, uh, should that be? Should we use the mask to prevent the spreading? Is the virus more dangerous in combination with some medicines? Uh, for instance, uh, medicine for blood pressure, as we heard. Which evidence should we trust the most? Should we trust evidence uh, that we have from previous theories? Should we trust evidence from small studies uh, that has been done so far? Should we wait for bigger studies, etc.? So in these cases, experts disagree, but they do not disagree over the facts. They disagree over the choice of methods, interpretation of results, estimation of risk. So, there are disagreement, they're disagreeing over what we call philosophical bias. Philosophical bias is a term that we started uh, to uh, name something that uh, philosophers have been talking about for, uh, I would say, centuries. Uh, and we gave it this name to uh, initiate and improve uh, the um, dialogue between philosophy, philosophy of science, and scientists. Uh, and we saw that we uh, quite uh, succeeded. Uh, we used the term for the first time in this uh, commentary in uh, eLife, which is a science uh, journal. And it, it was a very uh, popular comment uh, among, and it started uh, um, as we wanted the uh, uh, comments and uh, discussions also among scientists. So we call it philosophical bias both because of the word bias, but also because it's an acronym for basic implicit, implicit assumptions in science. And such assumptions can be of three types. They can be assumptions about how the world is, and we call it ontology. Assumptions about what we can know about the world, what, what we call epistemology. And at last, assumptions about how science ought to be practiced. And these are philosophical bias about norms and ethics. So when are these philosophical basis assumptions called bias? Not always. They're biased when they remain implicit. So notice that sometimes uh, scientists use, for instance, a model, 
and they assume uh, some uh, uh, something that is philosophical in nature. For instance, they assume determinism in a model to, to predict uh, population growth. That is not what we call a philosophical bias, because this is an explicit uh, assumption that is then accounted for in the results. Most of the times, though, uh, such uh, assumptions remain implicit in the sense that the scientists themselves remain unaware of the way such biases influence research. So they got this way of seeing the world or seeing how we know about the world from somewhere else, often about uh, from their education, and they're keeping using them, but they still are unaware of, the, of that. And like all other types of biases, these philosophical biases, they skew, they change the development of the hypothesis, the design of experiments, the evaluation of evidence, and the interpretation of results in different directions. That means people with different philosophical bias will make all sorts of different choices about these points. An example of uh, a philosophical bias of an ontological type is that is what we call bottom-up causation. Cause, causes travel from the bottom to the lower level, from the lower level to the upper level. So life and relations develop from molecules. For instance, we say that the DNA is the key of life. To understand life, we need to understand the chemistry of the DNA. But there's also the opposite philosophical bias, which is top-down causation, which would say that relationships shape the development of life and molecules, which means that if we want to understand the way our genes and DNA are formed, we have to look uh, at the relationships that we have and shape them. So if these philosophical bias are implicit, they're never stated, uh, why should we uh, try to explicate them? Well, we can give at least three reasons for that. The first is to reveal competing perspectives. For instance, a typical uh, you know, uh, discussion and uh, uh, divergence is on whether we would like, whether it is proper to start our inquiry or to rely more on experiments uh, in controlled conditions, or should we uh, rely rather on uh, uh, contextual observation? And, uh, if you look at these two positions, there are actually, two, uh, there are actually um, a disagreement among the two biases I talked to you about. So if you think that causation travels to the bottom up, so if you under to understand the relationship at the world, we need to understand parts and molecules. And it's normal that you will start with experiments when you look at these parts in isolation and you try to understand them. If on the other side you think that causation travels uh, from the up, to the bottom. So in order to understand molecules and, uh, and chemistry, you need to first understand relationships. Then you would think that it's better to start and to rely more in the contextual observation. Another uh, reason why uh, it is useful to explicate philosophical bias is to make your argument better and more transparent. So one thing is to say, uh, well, you know, I will not trust this uh, result if it doesn't come from controlled experiments, dot. Another way is, well, I think that reliability is the most important value in, uh, in science. So I would just try to trust what I can rely on. So it is only in controlled experiments where, uh, uh, where all the, the factor I control that I can rely that one factor made a certain change. On the other hand, you could, uh, on the other side, you could say, well, I disagree with you. I think that relevance is the most important value in science. So I prefer to have an observation that is relevant for my context, rather than being, uh, having something I can rely on, but I'm not sure what kind of uh, uh, difference it makes for the context of interest. And to come to a third reason, uh, making implicit philosophical bias explicit are important for democracy in science. What do we mean by that? Well, think about that. If arguments from experts are transparent, so their, their philosophical bias, their extra evidential premises are stated, then other actors will be able to look at that, that premises and scrutinize them because they're stated in, in an explicit way. And this is particularly important, for instance, 
when the scientific evaluation um, has consequences directly for a certain community, which is not the community of, of scientists. Uh, let's uh, think, for example, uh, about uh, evaluations about the toxicity of some pollution in a certain community. For instance, if you consider the case in which scientists need to test whether the exposure to a certain herbicide can provoke cancer on the farmers they use it on, or in their families who are exposed to it. So in order to use this, experts will collect data, analyze this data through statistics. But to decide whether the results is statistically significant, one has to set the p-value as a threshold. Right for statistical significance. So if the p-value is, if our result is uh, lower than a certain p-value, it will be statistically significant. So how how high how should this uh, uh, p-value be set? What is uh, what is the value of, of the significance, the threshold? Well, one argument for science that we uh, often hear and is not uh, uh, democratic is uh, well, this is a convention. Uh, the, the value of uh, the p-value is a convention. Well, this, this is something that excludes a certain part, uh, the, the non-scientists, because it's something that is, cannot be scrutinized. It's something mysterious that is given by science. Other types of argument that are uh, instead more democratic are arguments in which uh, your value, your non-evidential non values are put there as the first thing. For instance, one could say, well, we think that the most valuable here is uh, food production and growth when testing this herbicide. Then, as a consequence, we are most afraid that our test says that the herbicide is toxic, toxic, and then we forbid the herbicide based on the test. But actually, that was wrong. It is innocuous. And we are most afraid of that because we are afraid of stopping growth and food production for something that actually is inexistent. Then if we're afraid of that, we are most worried about false positive results of our test, which we call type one error. And if we are worried about that, then we're going to accordingly adjust the p-value threshold for significance. So we're going to make it more difficult to get posit positive statistical significant results when testing so toxicity, which would mean that our p-value is a lower threshold. So, put in this way, although the public doesn't uh, uh, understand the, uh, the rest of the test, they will understand that the basic value that, uh, that is used to make this evaluation is food production and growth. And then the community can scrutinize it. Is this the value we want to, to, uh, to choose to, to, set uh, to, to, to have for our community? Another uh, type of argument could be uh, the following. Well, we think that most valuable is health and safety of the community. So consequently, we're most afraid that the test says that the herbicide is innocuous and allow the herbicide when actually it is toxic. That's because we, we would allow something that is toxic uh, without knowing it. So with unknown uh, uh, health consequences. Therefore, we're most worried about false negative results, which are errors of type 2. And then accordingly, we adjust the p-value threshold for significance. So, so we make it easier to get positive statistical significant results when testing toxicity. Okay? Such uh, arguments are democratic arguments. They can be scrutinized uh, by uh, the community and by politicians. So being explicit about philosophical biases in scientific controversies makes science more transparent, more democratic, allows stakeholder participation and informed decision-making when experts disagree, instead of just staring at these experts and saying, we're not understanding anything here. But then the question is, is this something that scientists should uh, uh, try to reach as individuals? Well, we don't think so. We think it's really uh, hard and actually impossible. This is an institutional responsibility. And it's a responsibility, first of all, from the educating institutions, from universities. Universities should develop a culture for the critical discussion of the conceptual premises and meta-empirical issues. 
So this facilitates interdisciplinarity, not only putting people from different disciplines already form the mature and, and put them together in teams, but actually trying to uh, develop a culture for that, for this transparency. So by educating future sustainability researchers and practitioners in how to discuss philosophical bias in science and by promoting discussion and exchange among philosophers and scientists, we aim to transform scientific controversy into constructive dialogue within disciplines and between disciplines. And also not only within uh, uh, science, but I would have to say also with the public and with the decision makers. And this is uh, the, the seed of this course. This is uh, where the idea, the whole idea of a course like this uh, was born. And we're really hoping that uh, this is going to be something that uh, will have success and will become uh, institutional, maybe not only for this university. Okay, thank you.